Good morning and praise God for his goodness and mercies to us. I am so thankful that I'm part of the family of God, aren't you? And uh, we just want to praise you. I just want to let you know that uh, we're continuing to um, order and try to uh, get the paper at a reasonable cost for the next million great controversies to be scattered like the leaves of autumn. And uh, we're getting responses and things from all over the nation and other parts of the world. God's word will not come back void. We not, might not see immediate results, but we know that the publications will do its work. And as inspiration says, now the people come in from everywhere. So we know that God's people will come in out of Babylon and be ready for his very, very soon return. Before we begin the message this morning, turn around, don't drown, bow your heads with me and seek the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we just give you praise. We thank you again for the privilege of serving the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We do invite your Holy Spirit to be here in a double portion. We invite your holy angels to surround us, driving away the evil forces. And Lord, help us to realize the seriousness of the times in which we live and that we need to be surrendered fully and completely so that we can be prepared to meet Jesus in peace when he comes in the near future. Guard my words, my thoughts, my actions. May they be pleasing in thy sight for your glory. We pray these things and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn around, don't drown. How many times have you heard that? If I've heard that once, I'm sure I've heard it a thousand times. You hear it on the national news stations. Turn around, don't drown, flash flooding, warnings, flash flood, watches. And it's happening more and more frequent uh, as we go. And of course, we're told in the great controversy that calamities will come, the weather problems will be more and more disastrous, more and more frequent. We're seeing it happening. And uh, these warnings are given, you know, people don't drive through these high water areas uh, when the streams or the creeks or the rivers are, are overflowing. But you know, it doesn't make any difference uh, how many times people are warned, it, it seems. Uh, these things are heard over and over every time they have a storm, every time there's uh, um, some hard rains coming. They'll talk about that on the, on the weather. Uh, and, uh, but yet people don't seem to be heeding the warning. Pat and I were uh, on a trip doing some meetings or involved in meetings here not long ago. And when we returned home, uh, evidently the day before, we had about five and a half inches of rain in a very, very short period of time. And it washed some of the driveway and, it, and some of the bank gave way at the river. And so a friend of mine and I were out there the next day and we were piling some big rock in there and trying to shore up the bank and keep it from eroding any further. And while we were doing that, a helicopter came over and it's flying back and forth up and down the river. Obviously, they're looking for something, and uh, it wasn't long. There was some people that, um, first responders and uh, rescue squads, and people showed up at the bridge there by the river, and uh, they were looking for a middle-aged woman who had been swept away by the uh, flash flood, and they were looking for her body. Well, they did not find it that day, but a couple days later, they did find her body. But she was not the only one. Uh, there was another couple, um, middle-aged or senior citizens, and uh, their car, their Prius, I believe it was, got swept away. Uh, pretty small car to be driving in any water of any depth at all. But anyway, they got swept away, and they were both drowned. I remember a few years ago, down uh, not too far from our home, where there was a mother and her young child, and she was uh, trying to get her child to daycare or whatever so she could get to work and she's running a little late and so she decides not to turn around, uh, not to go around, but she decided, not knowingly, but she and her daughter drowned. As I thought about the drowning in the situation and I wonder if Noah, if ever used that phrase when Noah was preaching for 120 years and preparing the ark, did he ever say to the people, turn around, don't drown. And get away from the things of the world and the ideas and believe in God's word and get on board. Help us build, get on board and, and be saved. So I want to look at some scripture in Genesis chapter 6. I want us to look at 
the situation of Noah's day. In Genesis chapter 6, I'm going to be looking in verses 1 through 3. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters are born unto them, that the sons of God, God's faithful people who wanted to serve the Lord, saw the daughters of men, the unfaithful inhabitants of the world, Cain's descendants, that they were fair, and they looked uh, and took them for wives of all which they chose. Uh, evidently, some of the folks that were serving God, supposedly serving God, uh, saw the women, uh, the descendants of Cain, and thought they were make a better wife, or they were prettier, or they could play the piano better, or whatever it was, uh, decided to choose them. And folks, we can learn lessons from that today. Be not unequally yoked. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? So many of our young people, not only young people, but older people as well, are marrying outside of the faith. They're being led away from the truth. And um, they're making decisions that is going to cause them to be eternally lost unless uh, they surrender to the Lord and, and turn around and not drown. So we see these things happening in verse 3, and it says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Another lesson we learn here that even though God is merciful, God is long-suffering, God is compassionate, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. From these verses, we can see that there comes a point where God says, Okay, no more. The cup of indignation is full and uh, probation is going to close on you because you've been rejecting, 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 and rejecting. And we also told in Revelation, when God's cup of indignation is full, probation will close for the world. Will close for the world. But what was it like in Noah's day? Why did God destroy the earth by flood and its inhabitants, the Andaluvian inhabitants, to begin with? We find in verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of his thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The imagination of his purposes, the imaginations of his desires was evil continually in Noah's day during the Andalusian times. Verse 11, 12, 13, the earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, and the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. In other words, God did not use what many people think today, that God used Satan as the executioner. No, God is not in cooperation at all and uh, any working relationship with the devil. Uh, we need to understand that. Um, it says God uh, destroyed them. Sin brings destruction, and if we continue to follow and want to serve sin, even as loving as God is, there are consequences to our choices, and it's not his fault, it's our fault. We have been enlightened, we understand, and uh, but yet we choose a different way anyway. Well, what was it like? Other than that, what was it like in Noah's day? In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, we find a chapter written on this. Uh, it's called entitled The Flood. Um, and we find in the first few pages of that chapter, starting with page uh, 91 or 90, and uh, in page 92, it goes on and says these, this, Neither the marriage relation nor the rights of property were respected. Whoever coveted the wives and possessions of his neighbors took them by force, and men exulted in the deeds of violence. They delighted in destroying the life of animals and the use of flesh food, render them still more cruel and bloodthirsty until they came to regard human life with astonishing indifference." Is it any wonder that God, when he, when he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt and set them free and they were in the wilderness and they were headed for the Canaan land, is it any wonder why God took the flesh pots of Egypt away and gave them manna? Um, 
you know, it's uh, evidently there's something dealing with the flesh, eating of flesh, uh, that leads us to um, um, the lower passions are exalted and life becomes uh, more meaningless and less important all the time. You know, and it really troubles me, my brothers and sisters, when we have the leadership and, and uh, North American division, um, and which I've heard myself personally, and I've heard other people say at different camp meetings and special meetings, where some of the leadership will get up there and mock and make joke and make light of those who want to be vegan vegetarians, uh, who use tofu and make fun of tofu. Well, that's exactly what they did back in the wilderness. They said, ooh, we don't want to eat this stuff, this manna. What is this? Give us the flesh pots of Egypt. And counsel tells us those who are only half converted on this issue will leave God's people never to walk with him again. Don't disregard the counsel and the admonition and the commands of God when it comes to the health message or any other message, if we expect to go around or go through. In other words, we need to turn around. Don't drown. Don't be as, um, as numbskulls, let's say, as the Andalusians were, uh, were, or the, even the children of Israel going through the wilderness because most of them were lost. We don't want that to happen to any of us. But in page 97, it says uh, they continued in their festivities. We could say their sports, their amusements, etc. And as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, even speaking of the children of Israel, it says they ate and they drank and they rose up to play. Everything was more important, it, it seemed, than to be prepared and following the counsel of God so that they go, could go through across the Jordan into the Canaan land. And folks, we are like the children of Israel. We're wandering in this wilderness, this old world, and God wants to take us to the heavenly Canaan. Praise his name. The question is, will we turn around so we won't drown or so we won't be lost so that we can be fit for his service and be saved at last? In page 95, you know, Noah, it says in, in page 95, while Noah was giving his warning message to the world, his words testified of his sincerity. Not only his words, it says, it was thus that his faith was perfected and made evident. He gave the world an example of believing just what God says. All that he possessed, he invested in the ark. Are we willing to invest everything? Are we willing to sell all to, to get that pearl of precious price and that pearl of precious price is Jesus? Friends, because it's going to take everything. It's going to take all. It's going to take all. Well, let's look in, in um, what else Jesus said about the flood um, dealing with Noah's time. And uh, let's look at at Luke chapter 17, verse 26, Luke chapter 17 and verse 26, very familiar with all of us. And it says, Jesus saying, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also shall it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, and they bought, and they sold. In other words, life went on. Marriage didn't seem to be that important. People were divorcing all the time. And it's amazing, even among Christians, the divorce rate is just as much as it is in the world. Over 50%, I understand, end up in divorce. It has no meaning today. Um, and we are following in the same footsteps. So Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, it's going to be the same when he returns. And how was it? The vast, vast majority were lost. They were destroyed. Um, how many of you remember the uh, tsunami, uh, the Sumatra tsunami in Indonesia and Thailand and all through that area? Um, we find that there was a great earthquake, but before the great earthquake took place and the great tsunami came in, the large animals, the elephants, the uh, water of buffalo, the oxen, and all the larger animals especially, 
they noticed they broke away and they busted through their, their pens and they went to higher ground. It's interesting that the dumb beasts went to higher ground and yet 250,000 uh, laid on the beaches and drowned. The intelligentsia of the world drowned when the animals followed the, something that God had put, put into their instinct to go to higher ground, and it sounds just like the situation with the flood. The animals went in two by two, seven by sevens, and the other people would not heed the warning, turn around, don't drown, and they all drowned following they were a. Also in Luke 17, 32, it says, Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Turn around, Sister Lot. Don't drown, but she decided to keep on going away or back to the city instead of turning away from the city and following. And uh, we find Uzzah the same way, that wouldn't listen to instruction, decided to do what he thought was the right thing to do. And we know it appears that they were eternally lost. And the majority was lost in the flood. The majority was lost in Sodom and Gomorrah. What about today? What about today? In Isaiah, we read in Isaiah chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 22, it says, For though thy people Israel, speaking of God's people, be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consummation decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Out of all Israel, the sand of the sea, only a remnant are going to return. And we also find that in, in uh, Paul refers to it in, in, let's see, Romans. Romans chapter 9, verse 27, Paul refers to it this way. Isaiah, speaking of Isaiah, also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Why only a remnant? Friends, because we will not turn around from the things of this world and the things that we uh, love, the things that we desire that are outside of God's word, even things that are lawful, uh, we take those many times to extreme. We're not temperate in those things that would be lawful and it becomes a problem. Uh, inspiration tells us, pen of inspiration, um, Ellen White wrote, not one in 20 was be ready at the time she wrote that to be saved, not one in 20. We read another statement that says, not one in 100 of the youth are dedicated to the Lord and want to follow him. This is in uh, Warnings and Reproofs, Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 115. There is not one youth in 100 who feels his God-given responsibility. Every physical and mental capability should be carefully preserved and put to the best and highest use to advance the glory of God. But yet not one in a hundred youth we have all kinds of universities, colleges, but our young people are not leaving our university and colleges for the most part. Only a very, very, very few are going into God's work, being missionaries, reaching out, trying to save souls, trying to hasten the coming of Jesus. Well, why? Is there not enough grace? that the majority be lost? Is there not enough grace, God's grace, to save all mankind? Of course there's enough grace. Matter of fact, in Romans 12, 3, Paul says every man is given a measure of faith. It depends on what we decide to do with it. Are we going to follow the trends of the world or are we going to follow what thus saith the Lord? And why is so many, when it says in the church, would be lost? Because, friends, to be 85% saved is to be 100% lost. To be 95% saved is to be 100% lost. Listen to this statement. Nothing less than entire consecration to his service will Christ accept. Total consecration. I have a friend of mine calls me from time to time. And we'll get in a conversation about what I'm doing and what he's doing. And he's, oh, you know, I really need to be doing something. I need to get out there 
you know, I'm Laodicean and all. And he talks about it all the time, talks about it. He knows he's in that condition. But yet, he hasn't made a decision that he's going to allow Christ to take full charge and he's going to surrender 100%. Nothing less than entire consecration to Christ's service will he accept. Maranatha, page 83. You know, we need a straight testimony, friends. We're not getting much of that in the churches nowadays. The straight testimony we're told in page 270 must be given to counteract all the heresy, all the nonsense that have come into the church now. I just got a call yesterday from a man in California. Some of his best friends have gone off to God doesn't destroy, to Christ the not eternal, to there's no Holy Spirit. Every wind of doctrine, and like I told my brother, is that, you know, it's very, very arrogant or very prideful or arrogant or snubbish or whatever words you want to use to have a person who is a fallen human being after 6,000 years of sin, and we've been falling and falling and falling in the sense that, you know, we were created in the image of God, but how much brain power do we use? I understand that the most intelligent people on the planet only use about 7% of their brain capacity. I probably use about three. I'm not the smartest, uh, shiniest apple on the tree. But I praise God that he's willing, if he's willing to use a donkey, he's willing to use any of us. Amen? But the thing of it is, why is it that we're so prideful, we're so arrogant, we're so, so snubbish that with only at most 7% of the capacity of our brain after 6,000 years of fallen nature, we figure out about all about God, who He is. The Bible tells us He's higher above anything we know. He's wider than anything we know. He's deeper than anything we know. And we're going to try, we're going to be learning eternity about our God, our Creator. And yet we figure, think we've got it all figured out. Folks, I'm telling you, we better get back on our knees. We better get back in the Word. We better be putting away and allowing sin to be taken away from our hearts and our lives so that we can be prepared to meet Jesus when He comes. We'll find out more about it. We've got eternity to learn about it. Don't get caught up in those things that's going to draw you away uh, that becomes your religion. The cause of the shaking, we are told, is will part of a straight testimony given? Some will be converted by it. Others will rise up in opposition to it. This will cause a shaking in Adventism. We find that in, in early writings, page 270. We also find it in 1T. The testimony is page 181. And um, so, you know, it's time that we hear the straight testimony. When I think of hearing the straight testimony, I think of a verse that I just came across the other day and I was looking at and and it's uh, pretty powerful. We find it in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse 34, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34, Paul writes on the pen of inspiration, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. In other words, shame on us that there's still people on this planet that don't know about God, the Creator. One might write it this way in, in more literal uh, contemporary type English of today. Be sensible. Stop sinning. You should be embarrassed that some people still don't know about God. We should be embarrassed. You know, one of my pet uh, dislikes, I could say it that way, I guess, is um, such and such a church over in the state of whatever, uh, Colorado, is just celebrating its 125th anniversary. Like that's something to brag and boast about? 125 years as a church, and yet the neighborhood still doesn't know about the beast or the mark of the beast or who the true God is, and we're celebrating? Give me a break. We don't need to be celebrating. We need to be ashamed, and we need to plead with God to come in and take over 
because it says this, and this is what we need to do also in Corinthians, except 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourselves. Don't examine the pastor, the neighbor, examine yourselves. Now we know uh, by the fruits we shall know them, but this is talking about heart examination. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be a reprobate. Except ye be a reprobate. We should know those things. Now what does it mean? I looked it up in the dictionary. Reprobate, what does that mean? Depraved, vicious, unprincipled. In theology, rejected by God, excluded from salvation, and lost in sin. Examine yourself. Ron, examine yourself. You know, you know, like this friend that calls me. He knows he's not really right with the Lord. Oh, he has the Sabbath. He knows the state of the dead. He knows the sanctuary message except he realizes he's Laodicean, he's not doing what God has called him to do. We know in our heart of hearts, and we cannot take that gamble, folks. Don't let Satan tell you that we're gonna stay just where we are, do the things we wanna do, be 85% committed, and expect to be saved at last. It's not gonna happen. Turn around, don't drown. Again, I'll remind us, the inspiration says not one in 20 would be saved. And she wrote that years ago. What would she write today? Not one in 100 youth are dedicated to the Lord and have any interest in it. In Luke chapter, chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Let me read uh, verse 23. And, in, and Jesus said to them all, saying to us all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. In other words, there is a cross before a crown. We need to go through this world dedicated to the Lord, and yes, we're going to be buffeted. Yes, we're going to be picked on. Yes, we're going to be bullied because we're standing for the truth. We're going to be called fanatical. We're going to be called legalistic. We're going to have some of our own friends, supposedly, I was just reading it yesterday, some of our own friends in the church that's going to turn people against you, and they, for no reason, are going to turn against you as well if you stand for the truth and righteousness. I was just sharing in the Sabbath school class just last week, a church that I spoke at, and uh, I said, you know, if we don't get the message out, if we don't do things to get proclaimed, and someone says, well, we'll have the world be turned against us if we go out and do these things. Friends, they're gonna be a whole lot more against us if we don't get the word out. You cannot preach the gospel of Christ without uh, offending people. Jesus couldn't do it. We can't do it. We preach it in love, with concern, but we need to be more concerned about the salvation of their souls than we are our feelings, or rather they might get a little upset with us. We need to preach the truth and teach it in love. Deny self. Take up the cross and follow Jesus. Upward look, page 176. What is religion? It is the conformity of the whole being to the will of God. Not 85, not 95, not like ivory soap, 99.9% .9 pure, 100%. Christ will accept nothing less than 100% of our will. Well, is it, um, is it easy to do? Is it easy to do to surrender that will? Steps to Christ, page 43. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle. 
But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. If we submit to God 100%, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, starts working in our lives, starts changing our lives. It's amazing that the things we used to love will learn to hate, and the things we used to hate we learn to love. It's amazing what God will do. And as we continue to surrender Him, as we continue to turn around from this old world and the things of this world, and that we're not going to be destroyed, we won't drown. It's amazing what God will do, and He'll perfect us. He says, the work I've started in you, be confident, confident that I will finish the work that I've started with you. But if we're not willing to allow Him to do it day by day, it's not going to ever be finished. Faith I Live by, page 87. God desires to heal us, to set us free. But since this requires the entire transformation, a renewing of our whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to Him. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that ever was ever fought. The yielding of self, the surrender of all, the will of God requires a struggle. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. And we have the example of Jacob struggling with the angel all night long, and he finally realized who it truly was, but he struggled, I will not release, I will not turn thee loose unless you bless me. And friends, we need that struggle. I remember years ago when I first came back and I was struggling about whether I should serve the Lord or what should I do because uh, my Philistine wife didn't have any understanding about what was happening to me, and I'm struggling about the full surrender, the full surrender. I'm in the patrol car one, late one night. I go out to some property that was owned by the state and got out in the middle of nowhere where no one was around, got out of the patrol car, fell on my knees in the middle of a field, and I'm pleading with God. I'm having a, a Jacob-type struggle with God. And it was a struggle and a struggle. And the, praise God, uh, I was willing and said, Lord, not 85%, not 95%, but I surrender all 100%. And friends, we have to do that every single day. Conversion is not once in a lifetime. It's not once every two years. It's every single day we recommit our lives to the Jesus, to Lord Jesus, and let Him have complete control over us, over us. Let me read some of the statements. Very that should help us to set up and take notice and realize that it's going to be all or nothing with God. This is 5T, page 81. In this time, the gold, we're speaking here at the end of time, in this time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. True godliness will be clearly distinguished uh, from the appearance of tinsel of it. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Chaff like a cloud will borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. Again, I ask the question, is it because there's not enough grace? Oh, there's more than enough grace to save every man, woman, and child on the face of this planet. It's the choices we make. We will refuse to turn around. We would rather it appears to drown than to turn around. 5T, page 136, soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials. Listen, the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. Instead of being strengthened and confirmed by opposition, threats, and abuse, they will, be cower they will cowardly take the side of the oppressors. We can't be like Peter and says, I'll never deny you, Lord. But it says the majority of those who now appear to be genuine. That should make us all set up and take notice, friends. Set up and take notice. We need to do some self-examination. The time, at that time, during, it's during enemy opposition here at the last, the superficial conservative class, the members of the church will renounce the faith take their stand with its avowed enemies. From what has been shown me, this is 2T, two, two page 445, from what was shown me, but a small number of those now professing to believe the truth would be saved. Wow. Why? Remembering God's promises and threatenings are all conditional. It doesn't have to be that we're lost. 
We can turn around. As a matter of fact, it says in 2 Celestial Message 380, the church appears about to fall. But it does not fall while the sinners in Zion are sifted out. It's going to look bad, folks, a whole lot worse than it is now, and it looks real bad right now to me, but yet it's going to get a whole lot worse. Here's another statement, Great Controversy. Great Controversy, page 608. As the storm approaches, the Sunday Law Movement, as the storm approaches a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message. Who's that? It's not the Baptists, not the Methodists, not the Episcopal, not the Presbyterians. The seventh day Adventist, the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through the obedience to the truth. In other words, oh, who's worried about the health message? Who's worried about the dress message or how, how to conduct ourselves, how to live, what we should watch, which we, what we're reading, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandoned their position, and joined the ranks of opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. The majority, the greater proportion, are going to be swept away. We are told. We are told. Again, turn around. Don't drown. Examine ourselves to see what we are made of. To see what we are made of. In um, Ezekiel, sometimes we think because we have our names on the church books or maybe because... Uh, uh, we're fifth generation uh, uh, Seventh day Adventist or whatever. I've got it right here. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 20. Though Noah and Daniel and Job were in the land, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. In other words, it's the choices we make. It's the dedication that we give is going to determine these things. And, you know, uh, I was just talking to this brother the other day when he was saying these friends, good friends, have come in and they're preaching all this, teaching all this doctrine. And, uh, this family's children and his children are really good friends. He doesn't know what to do. And I said to this brother, you cannot expose your children. I don't care how big of great of friends they are. If they're teaching this kind of garbage and uh, heresy, it will affect your family. But I've been telling them for years, out of the cities, out of the cities, out of the cities. But we refuse to heed the warning. We've got all kinds of excuses. You know, rather be my business here, or rather it's more convenient here, or my kids are in school here, that type of thing. Again, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. So does it have to be that the majority be lost? Does it really have to be? No, I don't think so. I think we need to follow David if, as David was, had fallen into much sin he realized, uh, eventually realized what he had done and that he was that man that took that one little lamb when the prophet came to him. In Psalms 51, verse 10 and onward, it says, David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Friends, are you bringing anybody to Christ? When's the last time that you've had a Bible study with someone, end up in a baptism in God's remnant church and join God's people? How many, how many Bible studies you got going? How many pieces of literature you're handing out? How many, how many people you're reaching out to and doing? Or are we just taking up space in the church pew. Examine yourselves. God can change all that. He'll put that desire within us 
if we are but willing to do so. In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 64, Isaiah chapter 64, this is what we need to do, friends, if we expect to be what God wants us to be. Isaiah 54, or 64 and verse 8. O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou our potter, and we are all the work of Thy hand. We are all the work of Thy hand, friends, if we place ourselves in His hands. Our High Calling, page 335. The potter cannot mold and fashion unto honor that which has never been placed in his hands. The Christian life is one of daily surrender, submission, and continual overcoming. Every day, fresh victories will be gained. Self must be lost sight of, and the love of God must be constantly cultivated. Thus we grow up into Christ. Thus the life is fashioned according to the divine model. Let the hand of God work the clay for his own service. He knows just what kind of vessel he wants. He is the potter. We are the clay. We must place ourselves into his hands by faith and trust that he can make that vessel that he wants for us. And what happens when we do that? In Our High Calling, page 19. What can deity do for us? Everything, if we are willing to surrender all everything if we are willing to surrender all. In Upward Look, page 173, heaven's resources are limitless and they are at our command. What a promise. What a promise. The resources of heaven are limitless and they are at our command if we allow Christ to be the potter and make the vessel that he wants and have that full surrender, if we're willing to turn around from the things of this old world, so we won't drown or we won't be lost. It all has to do with the choice. Ministry of Healing, page 176. God has given us power of choice. It is ours to exercise. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot control our thoughts, our impulses, our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure, fit for God's service. But we can choose to serve God. We can give Him our will then he will work in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus, our whole nature will be brought under the control of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? That is so beautiful to me that we can't change it. We cannot control our thoughts. We cannot control our impulses. We cannot control our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure, fit for God's service, but we can choose to serve God. We can give Him our will. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change can be made in the life. By yielding the will to Christ, we ally ourselves with divine power. In other words, when my friend calls and yes, I know I'm laying a seat on it, we're told that Christ stands at the door and knocks. 
The interesting thing about that door, there's no handle, handle on the outside. It must be open from the inside. But Jesus said, if you'll open, I will come in and I will sup with you. I will change those likings for the world. I will change those bad habits that you are caught up into that's, that is opposed to the uh, truth of heaven. I'll do that if you just allow me to come in. And if you'll just turn around and walk towards me, I can do these things and will do these things. By yielding up the will to Christ, we ally ourselves with divine power. We receive strength from above to hold us steadfast. A pure and noble life, a life of victory over appetite and lust is possible to everyone who will unite his weak, wavering human will to the omnipotent, unwavering will of God. Oh, friends, that is, to me, is so powerful. It is such comfort to know that it's not something I have to get straightened out before I come to God. We come to God so that He can work in us and through us to do of His good pleasure. In Eric High Calling, page 162, this world is a place in which to prepare to appear in God's presence. Individuals will here show what power affects their hearts and controls their actions. If they prize anything higher than the truth, their hearts are not prepared to receive Christ. If sports friends are more important than the Word of God, if soap operas are more important than the Word of God, if our houses and our cars and our possessions are more important than the Word of God, we cannot be prepared to receive Jesus, and we will definitely be part of the group, not one in 20. And he is cons consequently shut out. If individuals... When tested, refuse to sacrifice their idols, the Spirit of God will leave them with their sinful traits unsubdued to the control of evil angels. Is the enemy of soul, friends, all right with you being in the Seventh-day Adventist Church as long as you're not fully committed doesn't bother him a bit. He wants you to think that you're okay when you're not okay. See, we don't believe this. You're okay and I'm okay. We need to examine ourselves to see if we are of God or we're reprobates. We need to see. Let me read that definition again of reprobate. Let me find it here. In theology, it's rejected by God, excluded from salvation, and lost in sin. God forbid that would be for any of us. Let us, as Christ's followers, search our hearts as with a lighted candle to see what manner of spirit we are of for our present and eternal good. Let us criticize our actions, our own actions, and critique them to see how they stand in the light of the law of God, to the law and to the testimony. Are we, by God's grace, living up to that? I pray that we will be surrendered so that we can. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we are His peculiar people, we should be. In Upward Look, page 172, God has called us to glory and virtue. We have no right to assimilate with the world, dressing, talking, and living as whirlings do. God has given us a high standard to reach. To enable man to reach this standard, God sent into the world His only begotten Son. In our behalf, Christ made an infinite 
sacrifice. By beholding, we become. When we realize the sacrifice that was made for us, we realize that we need to turn around from the things of this world and be what God wants us to do through His power, through His strength, through the indwelling of His Holy Spirit, that we can live such lives not because of us, but because of Him, that your neighbors and your friends, your family can start saying, I can tell they've been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. In Faith I Live by page 169, Inspiration writes, and I appeal it again today. I appeal to the members of the church to be Christians, to be Christ-like. Jesus was a worker and not for himself, but for others. If you are Christians, you will imitate his example. Awake, I beseech you from the sleep of death. It is too late to devote the strength of brain, bone, muscle to self-serving. Let not the last day find you destitute of heavenly treasure. Seek to push the triumphs of the cross. Seek to enlighten souls. Labor for the salvation of your fellow beings and your work will abide the trying test of fire. Let us remember that while the work we have to do may not be our choice, it is to be accepted as God's choice for us. In other words, he's the potter, we are the clay. Whether pleasing or unpleasing, we are to do the duty that lies nearest us. Friends, years ago when I was struggling with surrender of that will and my will, I just thought as I was younger and I was in the academy and different things, oh, if I give my heart to the Lord, he'll make me be a missionary and send me off to the jungles of Africa or something, and I don't want to go over there and do that. Let me tell you something, friends. Once we surrender all, 100%, without reservation. God will lead us in such a way that we will be so blessed and we will look back and we will say, praise the Lord for what he has done and doing in my life. I wouldn't have it any other way. That's what he wants to do for us. The question is, will we allow him to do it? Will we turn around so we won't drown? Will we heed the warnings of what God has given to us? because there's only, two, there's only two groups here at the end. One is gonna be hollering for the rocks and the caves to hide them from the face of the lamb. The other is gonna be looking up and say, lo, this is our God and he will save us and we'll hear those precious words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. Oh, Father, may we have the joy of salvation in our lives. May we have that joy that we wanna share that joy with everyone we come in contact with. May we want to be sharing about the love of Jesus and what he's done and what he's doing and warning the world of how they can avoid the mark of the beast and how they can receive the seal of God. That's what I want for my life. That's what I want for your lives as well. But it's all going to be depending on whether we're willing to turn around, submit fully and completely, 100% without reservation, and let Jesus have complete control of our lives and hearts. Let us pray, Father in heaven, I pray just now that you would send your Holy Spirit to touch the listener with your love and your goodness and your mercies and um, those that are struggling over these issues, those who have, you know, you make the altar calls and people sit in their pews and they don't move because there's something that they love more than they love the word. But oh Lord, I pray that somehow Help us to realize these decisions we're making is eternal. It's not just for the day. It's eternal salvational issues, eternal damnation or eternal lives, S spending time, eternity with no sickness, sorrow, death, sighing, crying, nothing but joy and pe peace and happiness throughout the ceaseless ages. Oh, Lord, we want to be part of that group. And I pray that each one, the sound of my voice, will want to be part of that group as well. And all to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. Take my heart, Lord. Use it as you see fit. May my life 
be a outgrowth of your love and your direction. We pray these things and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.